and thank you for joining us today. Right. So I'm just uh, conscious um, that perhaps not everyone in the audience knows who we are and what we do. So in terms of Compare the Market, we launched in 2006, which uh, sounds fairly recent to me. Uh, however, if I was to ask my 11 year old son, he thinks anything pre 2017 is ancient. So kind of relative, but it, it, it sounds very relevant, uh, recent to me. Uh, since then, we've grown uh, very rapidly. Um, and the meerkats are probably now the most famous thing that uh, we, we're kind of known for and are a large part of our brand and one of the reasons for our success. Essentially, we provide price comparison for a number of different products. Uh, initially, we started out on just insurance, but now we've, we've branched out to broadband, energy, mobile and financial products as well. Um, and we're on a mission to make great financial decision making easy for everyone. Oh, sorry. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, so I lead the data science team uh, at Compare the Market. Um, I've worked there now for just over two years. Um, I work closely with a, a wide range of teams across the business, essentially finding out what issues they have, what's in their roadmap, what's in their pipeline, and where we think machine learning and AI can help address these issues. In terms of data science and, and analytics, uh, worked in the business for over 20 years now across a, a wide range of verticals. Some of the companies there included Dunhumby, Moonpig, Experian, Ogilvy, Betfair and The Telegraph. So quite a, quite a wide, wide range. Um, in terms of outside interests, uh, for myself, uh, I play bass guitar in a, in a blues rock band. Uh, I think my wife is getting concerned at the number of uh, guitars uh, appearing all over the house. It was only uh, at, the, at the weekend. Um, I went into a music shop to purchase a, a plectrum, get some strings and came out with a new guitar. So uh, anyway, she's, she's, she's uh, learning, learning to live with them. They're part of the family now. Um, I also enjoy backgammon, uh, golf, which I, I don't play that well, but I enjoy it anyway. Uh, family days out and comedy writing. So in terms of customer engagement, so the customer engagement score is a holistic KPI that measures interactions with compare the market. We think of it as a measure of the intensity, the, the kind of frequency, recency and frequency that someone interacts with our products and services. And if you think what it, what it really boils down to and is really one of the main benefits of it is actually it's a holistic measure that combines uh, all the different data points in, into one single measure. It's also a lead metric for us because what we've seen is that the higher the engagement or the higher the engagement score, the more likely someone is to return and purchase again with us. So looking at the engagement score gives us an idea of where we think we'll be in 12 months time. And it also, um, we're also able to decompose the engagement score into the different uh, factors that make it up uh, and look at the different drivers and knowing how they each affect the, the engagement score. And we're able to track that over time. So in terms of um, one of the first questions that we had when building this out is, well, how do we, um, what events should we include? Um, and as you can see, there's a number of different ways a customer can interact with compare the market. So there's the, all the product journeys. So when a customer comes to the site, starts the quote journey, goes through to get quote, click through to provider, all these interactions with, with at least uh, 12 products there that you see. There's also app uh, download and usage, usage of some of our services like broadband speed check. Uh, we've also got um, how people interact with uh, their my account um, that, um, in terms of renewal reminders and auto check. And then there's how they're using the rewards as well. So when we think about our makeup, movies, meals, toys, and so forth, and finally email. So as you can see, quite a lot of, a lot of different interactions there. Um, we tried to include uh, every event that signaled a conscious customer um, intent, a positive intent. 
So we didn't include automated, anything that was automated where a customer might get enrolled and they hadn't made a conscious decision to do something. And I think this is, this is like the first key step in, in creating a customer engagement score. It's very all in encompassing. You want to know what do we think are the key events? And it's very much a kind of a two way conversation with the stakeholders because we have an idea, but also you talk to the, the SMEs in the different areas and, and they will have an idea as well, of course. Um, but really we just wanted to, um, we, I suppose we were limited a little bit by, we couldn't capture everything we wanted to capture, but we tried to capture the key interactions surrounding product rewards and emails. So where does the data science come in? So this was really about the next stage was understanding the, the business questions uh, and how to translate these into data science solution. So well, first question was, what does engagement mean? So as I said on the, on the previous slide, we are looking at it as a, a measure of intensity based on recency and frequency of a customer's interactions with our products and services. Why is it important? Well, we know uh, that the more engaged a customer is, the more they're likely to be an advocate of the brand and spend again and purchase and come back more frequently. And this is backed up by numerous research as well. So we wanted to uh, link that to a, a future business KPI in terms of future purchases. And then in terms of how, how do we measure it? So for every customer, um, we wanted to create a scorecard where we would take at, um, the interactions that they have with these different events over different times and try and assign weights of importance to those interactions and then simply multiply, multiply the number of frequent and the frequency that they've had with those interactions at those specific time points in order to bring together uh, for every customer a unique scorecard and unique engagement score that is for them. And then in terms of uh, how important uh, are different interactions. Um, this was quite an interesting one because when we, when we set off on this journey and you can read many articles on customer engagement, there wasn't actually a huge amount of research or work done on how best to get to the weightings. I think a lot of the time it's, it is through gut feel um, and people obviously having an instinct about what feature should be more important than another. Maybe like a click is worth more than an open, but what, how important is a click in relation to redeeming a movie? And so we wanted to try and remove some of that, that guesswork. Um, and the way that we did that was to build a predictive model. And in order to build a predictive model, we have to give it a target. So we gave it a target of future sales over the next 12 months, and then uh, input, uh, we built a, a predicted um, ridge regression model to sort of understand the coefficients and use those as the weightings. Yeah, so uh, as just discussed, I've, um, we modeled future sales as the target variable and the interactions as the explanatory variables. We also included a couple of control variables, uh, predominantly around, around geodems to kind of capture any other sort of external noise. So, so we were getting the pure measure of, of the actual interactions that we were interested in. Um, and the coefficients captured allowed us to score, as I said, at each, each event over different time periods. And simply you would have an interaction, a recency a period, and we'd multiply that by the frequency of that occurring in that time frame. And that by the weighting that had come out of the models, we used the coefficients from the model to derive the weightings. And then we would sum that up. And if you were to sum that up, you would get the total engagement score, or should I say the total raw engagement score for a customer. Um, next, what was really important to us was that the engagement score was meaningful. It was interpretable. And obviously, when you are in a situation where you have a bunch of events, uh, weightings and frequencies, when you sum them all up, they're going to come to a number of some kind. And the number itself might not make a huge amount of sense. I might have a number of 875. Cedric might have a number of 2000. What do these actually mean? And how can we make it a bit more meaningful? 
So one of the things that we did, we looked at the range of scores and we capped at the 99th percentile. You could cap at the 95th percentile, but we, we capped at the 99th percentile. We had a look at what that score was at that point, which was a score roughly of about 3000. And then we treated that as our hundred and then scaled to that accordingly. So basically we ended up dividing the scores by 30 so that everyone had a score between naught to hundred. Um, and this made things more interpretable for us. So we could now talk about customers being a certain percentage engaged or what percentage of our customers are, are fully engaged. The other thing um, that we did, uh, and I would suggest doing if, if you do build out an engagement score, is perhaps use the engagement score to uh, derive segments from the score. So you could do this e either in creating some quintiles or a number of different value groups so that you can start to bring them a little bit more to life so that you can have, for example, a very low engaged group to a very high engaged group. We just opted for five. Um, what this enables us to do is add a bit more color to them, uh, start profiling, um, start understanding those segments a bit more. Um, and the other good thing is that we're, we're able to do uh, a lot of retrospective analysis as well. So whilst we're still uh, in the process and, and it's only recently launched, there's a lot of uh, retrospective analysis we can do where we can measure uh, historic campaigns uh, that have gone out to our customers and look at how that affected the segment groups or the average score pre and post. So why, what does customer engagement mean for compare the market? Why is it important for all businesses? Um, so with customer engagement, a customer uh, has the opportunity to engage different points with each interaction they will increase their engagement score. And we know, and what we've proven with our data and, and backed up by research as well, is that a highly engaged customer is four times more likely to come back uh, than a low engaged customer. So we know it's very important. And as I mentioned before, um, it's really a customer centric lens on performance, right? It's a, it's a key KPI. It's really measuring the strength of our relationship with the customer, distilling all those points in, into one number that is really like a, a health check of, of the base. Um, also being a KPI in its own right, um, it's an actionable customer level attribute that you can use to perhaps tailor marketing messages to certain engagement groups or decide to target certain groups. Uh, you can identify highly engaged customers, what they look like um, in terms of uh, perhaps looking at some of the, if you can find any lookalikes, um, or if you find those, encourage, nudge them or nurture them, encourage them to keep going. Um, you're also able to recognize if people perhaps look in decline and how we might mitigate against that. Uh, so if people have moved from very high to high or from high to, to low, why is that? that or perhaps even do some research to the low engaged segments to find out, you know, if there's anything that we can do to, to help that with any propositions or messaging. And it can also be used for sort of media efficiencies as well in terms of a bidding optimization, perhaps not wanting to bid as much on uh, someone that you know is of a high value to you already or helping you to find lookalikes that you might want to bid, bid on. So I think it's got a, a whole range uh, of really, really good uses, uh, not just a KPI, uh, but um, as I said before, it's also um, can be used for, for analysis uh, purposes. As I said, tracking pre and post uh, perhaps marketing performance and how the, uh, how the engagement scale dial has shifted as a result of any activity. Um, I think. Yeah, that's that's me. So I'm I'm now going to uh, hand over to Cedric. Um, right. Um, Thank you, Lloyd. That's all right. Uh, let me just unshare. Okay, I just share my screen. Okay, can you also my screen? Okay. Yeah. So thanks, Lloyd. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, 
I'm Cedric for 24. I will go through this presentation. Uh, during the presentation, I will share with you the work we have done for the neighborhood bills calculator with some of our learning. Yes. So about myself, uh, I'm a senior machine learning engineer at Compare the Market. I've been working here for three years already. And I work closely with data scientists to understand the machine learning model and to integrate them into our production environment. And I work also a lot with our solution architects and cloud engineers to design and implement our various data solution platform and tools. Just to give you an example of this one, uh, recently we have implemented our data science and analytics platform with Databricks. So I had to work with uh, the data scientist to define all our use cases and with the solution architects and the cloud engineers to design and implement the full architecture. So we have started writing a blog series on Medium on what we have done just to share a bit of our experience with our learning. So at the end of the webinar, we share the links with you and feel free to reach out to myself if you want to have more details about this work. So talking about uh, the neighborhood bills calculator, uh, first of all, if you have been on Compare the Market website, you will see that in order to get a quote, in order to get some prices from our partners, you need to answer a set of questions. And sometimes some journeys can be very long, which is normal because all the answers are required in order to get a quote. But uh, when the journey is long, this can increase the saving expectation of our customers. And on this point, Compare the Market is working hard every day to improve our customer experience. For example, they are making some questions easy to understand. They are also uh, improving the order of the questions to make uh, so that they will make more sense to our customers and even reducing the number of questions if possible. But at the same time, we thought that we asked ourselves if it was possible to build a tool that we allow our customer to know how much they will pay for an insurance even before they start the journey. So that's where came the idea of the neighborhood bills calculator. So what is the neighborhood bills calculator? It's a widget on Compare the Market website. So if you go on the website, you will easily find the widget. It's a widget with very basic question. It will take you less than a minute to answer all the questions. And when you answer the questions, the widget will give you an idea on how much you will spend for your energy bill or your home and contents cover insurance. So instead of starting your journey directly, we give our customers the opportunity and option to first go on the widget, try it to see the price. This is not the exact price, but it gives you an idea of how much you will spend. And then you can go to the journey to get the exact price. So the widget is just for us to give an idea of the price to the customer, but in order to have the exact one, they will have to go through the full journey. And in order to build the widget, we had to agree internally with our legal team, the product team, and the data scientist on some principle and constraint. The first one was to build an accurate model because behind the widget, you have a machine learning model. So we had to make sure that the machine learning model was producing prices with a pretty good accuracy, actually an accuracy which was above a threshold defined internally. And we should bear in mind as well that the idea is not to sell to the widget. The goal of the widget is just to help our customer to know more or less how much they will pay for an insurance, but not to get the exact price. So the idea is not to sell through the widget. And then one important point was to ask the minimum number of the question on the widget. Later we'll see that, but the customer have to answer a very few amount of questions, very basic question because the, 
we didn't want them to think too much or to make any research before answering the question. And if we want to add an additional question on the widget, we have to justify it by the fact that adding a new question will largely increment the accuracy gain. And also the question will still be very basic for our customer to answer. So if we go at the model itself, so we have implemented two machine learning models uh, using the XGBoost algorithm in Python. Actually, even before going to the model, I just wanted to raise the fact that the initial request was to produce just a simple set of rule that was able to predict to infer the price with a good accuracy, but we managed to have a really good result with a machine learning algorithm. That's why we decided to move to a machine learning model instead of using just a simple, a simple rule-based application. So as I said, we have two machine learning models. The first one is the energy price estimation. And the second one is the home and contents cover price estimation. And instead of asking the 70 or plus questions that we have on a typical journal compared to the market, we decided to ask only six questions on the widget and behind internally, there are some features that were inferred in order to make the prediction. So if you look at the screen, you will see we are asking the postcode, the property type, uh, the property ownership, the duration in the property, the number of room and the number of bedrooms. So as you can see, these are very basic questions that we are asking to the customers. Now, if we look at the architecture itself, on the right hand side, you have the data sense framework. The data sense framework is our internal factory where we do everything related to a machine learning model. So when we want to build a machine learning model, to retrain a model, to get the drift, everything happens within the data science framework. So all our batch application, we run into the data science framework. And then once we generate a new model, we will move the model to the model storage, which is a location where all our model stays. And in front of that, we have the data predictive API, which is a real time service that will load the model from the model storage and make it available for real time queries. In front of the security on the in front of the data predictive API, you'll have a security layer just to make sure that only authorized users can access the API. And in front of it, we have the front end API. Actually, the front end team played a major role we for the neighborhood bills calculator because they are the one building the interface between our service and our external partner. So as you can see here, we have a single API in which we are running two machine learning models. But with the single APIs, we have multiple services. So as you can see, we are not powering only the neighborhood bills calculator on compare the market website. But the same model is used on this is money website, which is one of our partners, uh, where we have also some widgets in some of the articles. We also have a bot on Facebook Messenger where when you answer some question, it tells you more or less you will spend on energy. So as you can see, basically we will have one machine learning model but at the end, we had uh, three different services using the models. Uh, yes, voila, this is the result. So when you fill the form on the neighborhood bills calculator widget, you will get three prices. The first one is for the broadband. This does not belong to the data science team. This has been built by another team, but you can have also the energy price and the building and contents cover insurances that will appear. And if you are happy with the price, you just click on start a quote to continue. Even if you are not happy, you can still click on start a quote. 
go and see the end and have the exact price because as I said, this is just an estimation. It's just to help our customers to understand more or less how much they will spend. Yes, I cannot comment too much on the numbers or the outcome results of this, but so far we have very positive results uh, which are above what we were targeting. And we are always looking into ways to improve the widgets and the model behind. We are always trying maybe to change the questions to rebuild the model. So all the time, this is a constant work. We are keep learning and improving our model and our widget. Yes, so that's all for me. And yes, if you want to find out, please you can reach out to Lloyd or myself on LinkedIn and also on Medium where we have some written some blogs. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Cedric, and thank you, Lloyd. Um, Lloyd, I'll ask you to uh, camera on and unmute, and I will begin uh, asking the questions. So just a reminder to everyone, if you want to type in a question in the Q&A box below, um, we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. Uh, so I think first, first uh, question, I might, I might pose this to, to Lloyd. How do you make sure the score is still relevant if the business is always changing? Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, and relates to what our plans are for future evolutions of, of the score. I think the plan at the moment is to, to revisit the score say every, every six or 12 months. Uh, this could either be to include new interactions or just to remodel to see if the, the customer behavior has, has significantly changed. But what we what we're conscious of not doing is because the business con is continually evolving, um, it, and it is important to revisit and update over time. It, we don't want to do this so frequently that the score becomes ever changing, and we can't track it month on month, or we have to keep changing our targets. So we kind of want to put a stake in the ground that every six months or every twelve months we review, maybe incorporate some new data points that we didn't have before. Um, nothing to, of course, stop us um, tracking those data points uh, without incorporating them into the score just to see how they're, they're performing in their own right. Because ultimately, if they are new data points, we don't have uh, we won't have a huge amount of historic data to to learn from them on. Uh, we may have uh, we may wait until we have a few weeks worth of data to sort of assess how popular they are maybe to an existing product or service that we have waited. So we know for these new in, newer interactions, we've got a rough idea of, in comparison to that, we think this waiting is half of that one. So we'll, elect, we'll, we'll capture a weight like that. But as I said, so we'll, 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 we try to remain as, as relevant as possible, but we don't wanna keep changing it regularly. So we just have points in the, in the ground. I've muted myself. Thank you very much, Lloyd. So I might pass one over to Cedric then. So um, what were the main learnings from using an API from three different services? I imagine that's a, a kind of a, a problem or a requirement that lots of um, lots of the participants today would, would have. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say when we started this project, we started only with This Is Money website. So the idea was to build a widget on This Is Money. So we used this project to implement a robust, very resilient application. So with This Is Money, everything was fine. So we were able to build the foundation of the project. Then given the positive outcome, we decided to move to Facebook. And it was really interesting to have it running on Facebook because since uh, This Is Money is one of our partners, we cannot control what is happening on the widget. So even if a customer drops, you won't know why. But with Facebook Messenger, the great thing is that since this is a conversation, if a question is too, is too difficult for a customer, the customer will drop or maybe spend too much time before answering. So now you know that this question is too difficult for our customer. Maybe we might need to rephrase it or to remove it from the, from, from the list of features. So I would say the main learning was really on the behaviors of our customers 
because when we you when you use different channels it allows you to get the different feedbacks that might be complementary and helps you to uh, strengthen the model that is running behind yeah and then i'm going to pass this to either of you um and depending on um how joined up your organization is uh, you might answer the same or you might actually have different answers. So what is the tech stack you're using for your data science framework and model storage? Yeah, that's a good question. So initially, we were mainly using AWS stack. So the data scientists, they are using scikit-learn with their Python, Python script and so on. And everything was deployed on AWS using AWS data pipeline to run the models. And the model were managed and stored on S3. So now that we moved recently with a new data science and analytics platform, we are mainly using Databricks. So we have the model registry within Databricks that we will use to store and manage the model lifecycle. And we can use tools within Databricks like jobs to run our models. But at the same time, depending on the use case, we must still go back on uh, AWS data pipeline for some applications. So yes, mainly Databricks yeah. and AWS Data Pipeline. I see a lot of nodding yeah. from Lloyd. So I'm gonna take yeah. that you have a very joined up organization and it's all exactly. consistent. We're, yeah, perfectly joined up. Cedric and I work very closely together. So when we, um, when my team comes towards the end of um, uh, building a model or a segmentation, uh, we work then very closely with Cedric, I think, who helps us to productionize that. So yeah, we are very close. Yeah. So I'm going to pose one uh, to you, Lloyd, because it will be about um, your talk. So could engagement be a negative thing? So for example, the has customer has to go through lots of steps before getting what they want. They will have a high engagement score, but they might not be happy. Well, uh, we um, so we didn't capture those specific. We didn't capture the uh, all the interactions with, say, for example, the individual questions on the journey. We were capturing a, a, a little bit of a level up from that. That they've that whether or not they've, they've started the journey, get quote or click click to provider as they go down the funnel. Not whether you know they did multiple clicks on a particular, which is I suppose more of a frustration score because I. What we didn't include were, um, and perhaps we could consider this in a, in a later phase when you talk about evolving it, uh, negative in, interaction. So you've mentioned there um, maybe an element of frustration, or you could argue opting out of communications or complaints to, to customer service or any, anything like that it might be viewed as negative. Um, we didn't include those because the data is well a couple of reasons the data is not as easy to get get hold of for some, some of those but also um i think by definition you will naturally see if some of these negative things have happened you will see these people doing less of the positive things that we've captured so their score by definition will go down but it is an interesting point um i don't think the example uh, you've given there will actually uh it wouldn't necessarily show up in our score because we're looking at people completing different stages and not how how maybe how they've struggled within a journey itself but uh, there's an, perhaps that might lead more to a um lend itself a bit more if we think about positive and negative interactions that could lead itself perhaps more to a customer experience score which could be something we might develop as well so capturing um how a customer feels about their experience whereas i suppose the customer engagement is more about what they're doing so these kind of positive negative ones might might feed into something else so you've given us some food for thought there <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you've just got uh, a positive bit of feedback that you've had to take into the organization, <laughs> potentially, yeah. and a next yeah. iteration of this talk might be an experience yeah. score. Experience um, yeah. So a uh, question um, probably more targeted towards Cedric. Have you employed MLOps principles so that the ML models can self-train if their performance drops below a certain threshold? Yes, yes. Actually, what we do every week we have our machine learning model that are live. We are going to, what we do, we pull the data we have received during the week. We will pass them through the model and check the accuracy. If the accuracy is still above the threshold that we have defined, it's fine. But if we realize that the accuracy drop down, we will return the model automatically. So we definitely use it, yes. 
Excellent. And then um, one for Lloyd. How did you calculate future sales as your target variable? Were you just measuring interactions up to a certain date and then calculating yeah. sales yeah. over a certain period? We were just, well, because we wanted to use as much historic data as possible, uh, we were using historic data over the last three years to predict uh, sales over and purchases over the next 12 months. Because very, um, our business is obviously, obviously insurance is of a cyclical nature, a uh, typical annual cycle. We wanted to try and have enough uh, historic data to be able to capture perhaps at least three cycles. And then that allows us, the, the more historic data we have, the less that allows us to play with uh, a longer period going forward. But we thought a 12 month window in front should give us a, a good idea of based on the um, interactions in the past of, of what is important for the next 12 months for a customer so what we'd expect them to do in the next 12 months it also aligns very heavily with um, a lot of our, our measures our internal uh, business kpis are measured on a sort of either a forward or backward looking 12 months so we wanted to do a line with that as well um, and the reason for three months uh, is that uh, it, we thought it was important to give a score to everyone so not necessarily just our active customers but perhaps our lapsed customers as well to understand you know that there might be a customer that hasn't been active with us for a, uh, for a little while but they have been quite, uh, quite engaged with us a while back so we wanted to try and capture that that was another reason for having a, a, a longer historic period mm. and then um, while you're answering there was one I saw come through before that I might get you to answer for for all of the participants was the score linked to customer lifetime value measurement as well or is it a completely separate measure it is well i suppose they are they are closely related but our, our intention was to develop with the customer engagement score was to develop a, a scorecard that is accessible and transparent for the business um perhaps if we were to do a, li a lifetime value we might look out maybe further than 12 months we may have done two years or three years in the future potentially and we may not have done um ridge regression we may have used a bit more of a black box method to get uh, perhaps uh, a greater accuracy but it might have been less interpretable so for this it was the key thing was getting that happy medium of interpretability and and it's still being uh, accurate as well but something that the business could really understand hmm. and then over to cedric um if you could just walk us through the order in which the services were deployed so we could get a bit more of a feel for it. Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, the first one was really this is money because this is where everything has started. We had to build a widget on our partner website, a very simple and easy widget that we allow the customer, people on their website to know more or less what they will spend on energy for the property and then we moved to Facebook Messenger to build that uh, boat conversation. And actually from Facebook Messenger, we realized that some of the questions we're asking on the widget were too difficult for our customers. So we had to review the model. So we went through an internal process to discuss with the legal team, the product owner, and so on, to define the adequate set of questions that will allow us to have a good accuracy and be easy for our customer. So that's what we did after Facebook Messenger. We had to return the model to recreate a new version of the model to deploy it again on This Is Money, Facebook Messenger. And now, given the success of the project, we decided then to move on compare the market website. Yes. And I guess thinking about um how you deploy things like this in an organization. I know that I think everyone on this um, Zoom call today would see that what you've presented is both very beneficial and, and, and for customers, but also driving you know, real business value as well. Um, I guess I'll put the first part of this question to, to you, Lloyd, but was there any pushback um, from implementing something like this in the organization, given it really exposes all of the activity that you're doing and quantifies you know, how important it is um, for consumers? Um, well, I guess we, we were quite lucky that senior stakeholders uh, around the business fully embraced the idea behind how we intended to build the, the engagement score. 
I think what really helped was that we were aligning uh, it to an outcome that mattered to the business in terms of future purchases in the next 12 months so that there is a correlation between the two. And that really helped, I think, to make sure that there was buy-in. The key thing here, I think, is that most of the discussion and the open collaboration concerned which variables uh, and events to use. So we had an idea, but it was through these uh, discovery sessions that we were uh, kind of getting sign off on what we thought would be the key inputs, uh, trying to come to that kind of common consensus uh, based on capturing as many of those key positive interactions we could, given the uh, da data limitations that we had. Um, I think another, another thing that really helped, uh, and again, would encourage everyone to do this, is we tried to, um, we, we had regular, we had a small working group, which featured, which uh, had not only the, the stakeholders, but people from different parts of the business, where we would regularly play back our findings throughout, so that we kind of took them on that journey with us, and we needed to refine the weightings or um and so it was a i guess this is really where ultimately science met art uh, we started off with the science and then we kind of have a, a discussion about it and see if anything needs tweaking um and that's where the two kind of come together where we reach that happy happy medium as best as we can knowing that no model no single equation is perfect this was just our way of doing it but and this is how we reached reached our uh, our goal and then Cedric, you touched on, um, you know, needing certain thresholds to be met from a compliance perspective, but it would be great if you could just touch on who were the different teams or the different roles, both from a technical and non-technical perspective that you need to have involved to, to get something like this off the ground um, and in market. Yes, uh, I think the first one and maybe very important in this project was the legal team because for compliance purpose we they need to make sure that we are doing the right thing for our customers and then we have also the data governance team that needs to understand what we are doing because when we make this type of automated decision it can be quite sensitive so it's very important to have the data governance with us so that they can make sure we are doing the right things and after that we have the product team, they are the one that know the business. So without them, there is nothing we can do. So it's very important to have them with us during the process. And then on the technical side, of course, the data scientist and the machine learning team, but also the solution architect and enterprise architecture team, because they will be the one that will help us to design the architecture and they always have great feedback, so it's always good to hear from them because they are doing this a lot in the daily work, so it's good to hear from them. And on another side, we have the cloud engineers because they will be the one implementing the infrastructure. And well, we also need the data engineers, but in my case, in the case of the neighborhood bliss calculator, we already have the proper data in place. They already did a great job, so we didn't need them anymore on this, yes. But I would say these are the teams that were involved in this project. Great, so I think I'm gonna ask one more question um, to each of you that I've got, which is, a, a, I guess, a suggestion to the participants. If you eagerly want to ask anything, get it in now. Um, my final question, I might um, stick with you, Cedric, and then I'll get to word afterwards. If you could just thinking about what was the hardest thing that you had to do or factor in in this build and let us know what that was and, and I guess how you overcame that. Um, I would say maybe the hardest thing was to meet all the requirements and the principle of the project because we had to build a pretty accurate models with the minimum amount of information. And there was a lot of discussion with the legal team, the product team, because sometimes, well, it happened that we had a great model that were performing very well, was performing very well, but the product team is not happy with it. Then we go back, we rebuild the model, then the legal team is not happy with it. So it was very hard to find the right ground that will meet all the requirements. And the second part that was quite tricky, I would say the integration with Facebook, not because it's something too difficult, but it was the first time for us to try it. So we had to try many things to integrate it into our environment. Yes, I would say they were the hardest things, but necessary that we had to do, yes. 
Excellent. And then Lloyd, I think that, you know, a lot of, um, in my experience anyway, a lot of times, you know, you have different people within in an organization um, quoting and requesting certain types of models or certain types of analysis. And I'm wondering if you were asked this, because I know I have definitely been asked this in my career, why didn't you just do RFM modeling? And if you could give us the rationale for that, that would be great, because I'm sure it's a question that um, everyone may have experienced or will likely experience in the future. Yeah, that's uh, no, that's a good point. I mean, RFM modeling wasn't, or RFM sort of segmentation wasn't kind of suited to this. Um, really it's not really suited to understand the relative importance of, of different interactions and get engaging how immersed customers are within the entire ecosystem of different products rewards and services really it's it's quite useful um, it's more it's probably like a level up the i suppose rfm on steroids <laughs> so it's probably a a, a a a type of version of this where we've gone granular and almost it's almost like an RFM, but in any individual points rather than a, um, uh, an overall RFM, which tends to focus mainly on transactional or monetary uh, values. One where people are open, opening up a, a, an email, clicking on an email or using any of our services. So we wanted to do something that was much more encompassing um, and put all these factors uh, together. And, and that's where kind of ridge regression came in and, and was really uh, really useful in that we had to obviously as I said give it a target target variable and that's something that we we when we were researching a, cus, a customer engagement we hadn't really found anyone actually using any methodology or anything to actually uh, do that other than I suppose as I said before intelligent guesswork and gut feel so we that's where we wanted to gather that all the events that we could think of and run them through a model to give us our starting point which would then lead to conversations with stakeholders about what definitely stays in what might come out or what gets tweaked but yeah right. well at this point um I think I just want to say a huge thing Thank you to, to Cedric and Lloyd. This was really, really interesting and useful. And I'm really excited to, to kind of learn about how this has evolved and, and the kind of impact that it's having in the future. Um, so please join me in thanking um, Cedric and Lloyd and you can reach out to them on LinkedIn. Uh, their details are on the chat. Um, and uh, as was mentioned earlier, this will be, this is being recorded and I believe it will be um, available in the DSF site. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.